Hi, I'm Bill Harvey with the Auto Sales Academy, and I hope you're having a fantastic day in Canada. This is the best weekend in the entire year because it's the springtime. It's the first holiday weekend other than Easter. It generally means that the cottages are open, the golf courses are open, the Stanley Cup playoffs are underway, and it is a holiday. We are closed Monday. So for all of you in Canada, happy Victoria Day weekend. I hope you're, ha you're, I hope you're gonna have a great one. I hope you've got super plans for that as well. I wanted to share with you some negotiation strategy. What I'm getting right now is a number of calls and questions from clients and dealers and friends and previous students about, hey, look, Bill, things are really changing. They're changing quickly. What we're seeing is a, a departure from the inventory shortage and that kind of customer that just came in and simply paid the price that we were asking to the traditional kind of shopper that we had, let's say, pre-inventory shortage that's going back to 2018 and earlier. Now they're looking for discounts. Now they're shopping around. Not, now they're not afraid to drive miles and make tons of inquiries on the phone and lots of emails. And what we're finding is those fundamental sales skills of negotiation and closing and following the steps to the sale and understanding buyer behavior are all critical, always have been, never went away. But when we experience that magnificent demand level and inverted supply level, I mean, this is the stuff that I talked about at the Automotive Business School of Canada in an economics class as, you know, what happened if? What if we had magnificent demand for what we had and the supply? And what if every manufacturer was in the same boat? And that's exactly what we experience. And so for those automobile buyers that needed to get a car now or simply wanted to or had the means to buy at any time and enjoy the trade cycle of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, they could certainly come in and they were nice and equitable to deal with. And that's what I call one kind of negotiator. So what I want to share with you, specifically as it addresses negotiation, because I put negotiate and closing together in one step of my eight steps. So let's keep in mind where we are in the sales process. So we've gone from a, a meeting and greeting to an interview, which is a selective vehicle interview, to a selective vehicle walk around presentation, hitting on the things that are most important to people, to a demonstration drive or an evaluation drive, making sure that this is what they want. And now we're at that negotiating closing stage where we've got the trade appraisal, which is vitally important, always has been. It always amazed me how many teachers, trainers, and authors in the automotive retail business never identified the trade appraisal as a step. They just kind of lumped it together with closing and negotiation. And of course, I put it into that bucket of purchase consultation. And the beauty of the purchase consultation, putting it in there, is that negotiation and closing, albeit our separate skills are one step in the multiple steps to the sale, of which I only have five. And of course, all of this is laid out really well in our manifesto. If you want to learn more about that, please book a discovery call with me or go to our website, the Auto Dealership Academy. Dot com, the auto dealership academy dot com, and schedule a discovery call. Be happy to share all the details about it. You can even schedule a strategy call and it can help you identify how you can get into double digit sales every single month on track to earn a six figure income. So with negotiating closing, what you'll learn very quickly, if you've been at it for three days and sold three automobiles so far, that negotiation and closing must be aligned. Otherwise, there's combat, there's friction. It's not nice, there's pushback. The customer's pushing back and you're pushing back. The activities, the skills of negotiating and closing must be aligned in order for you to have any kind of success. So I put closing ahead of negotiation in the manifesto from a skills perspective to learn. You must have nailed 
the buyer behavior. You must understand the eight steps of the sale. You must be able to do a phenomenal vehicle walk around presentation demonstration before you ever get to closing. But closing is more important a step than negotiation because if you don't ask for the sale, you're not ever going to get to double digits. And obviously, if you can't negotiate, you're not going to close the sale. So the two must be aligned. They are synergistic. They work together. They fit in like pieces of a puzzle but here's where average ordinary salespeople fall apart and they really don't get it negotiation has three components to it you have to start with you have you the second component is the sale and the third component is obviously the customer the shopper the buyer so what I discovered years ago when really studying negotiation, when I was going through that miserable, difficult time of couldn't close the broadside, broadside of a barn door, couldn't sell myself out of a wet paper bag, any analogy, any metaphor that you want to go to, I dove hard into negotiation, read the 25 books attended the 10 seminars and never really got the answer because some of those seminars had nothing to do with selling automobiles. It was just straight negotiation training, which by the way, was absolutely incredible. Getting to yes, a great book, albeit a fantastic book, and it will teach you lots about negotiation if you don't know a whole lot, but not a lot of it applies directly to automotive sales. And what I pulled out of it was what we don't do well in the automotive world is recognizing these three components that our manufacturers do an incredible incredible job of convincing us that you will be, if you do a great job and you follow up with everybody, you will be the only salesperson they ever want to deal with. And that would put us at a nice negotiator level. Now there are two types of negotiators, as you can tell by me starting off with nice, there is nice and then there is the aggressive. So what happens is if you haven't identified the type of negotiator that you have, then none of this makes any sense and you have a very difficult time closing. And so the reason why closing comes before negotiation is that if you haven't completed the, the closing strategy, if you haven't gone through the overview benefit and permission and socked commitment as a result of your overview benefit permission to take delivery of this automobile, then you'll have a very difficult time uh, and an almost an impossible time selling that automobile, which a lot of us default to negotiation, discounting the price of the vehicle to put a sticker on the board. If you're after stickers on the board, no problem at all. This isn't for you. But if you want to make a six figure income, you don't want to work any extra hours. You want to capitalize on repeat referral business that close 40% better than walk-in traffic, but you need the walk-in, the phone-ins, the internet inquiries to be able to get repeat referral business. Then you quickly must recognize which kind of negotiator you're dealing with. And for some people, this is a one-time transaction transaction. That is the aggressive type of negotiator. Then for others that especially live in rural communities that do not want to go to a metropolitan center or a metropolitan center is miles and hours drive away, these people are typically a nicer negotiator. Now it doesn't mean that you're going to make more money as a result of it. It just determines your negotiation behavior with these individuals. So right out of the gate, what you want to find out is what the buyer behavior is that you're dealing with. Are they an aggressive buyer? Are they a talkative, talkative buyer? Are they a great listener or do they listen more than they speak? Or are they an enthusiast? Now, once you've determined the buyer behavior, you pretty much have figured out what kind of a negotiator they're going to be because that determines whether you are nice or aggressive in your negotiation and closing activities. You become aggressive with more pointed directive requests for the sale. You can be nice and not draw at the sales process, but being pleasantly persuasive while being agreeably aggressive, you can accomplish way more sales, recognizing that the sale this individual is thinking of determines the behavior you will be. For instance, 
Two aggressives, only two aggressives will respect each other. So if you go into a negotiation scenario and you're being nice and they're being aggressive, they're going to attempt to walk all over you because at the end of the day, maybe you've heard the term win-win. This is a very difficult subject for me to, to explain because you haven't gone through my Master of Negotiation workshop and that sets the stage for my statement that may offend you and my apologies if it does, but feel free to reach out to me, DM me, ask a question. How could I possibly believe that? There are winners and losers in negotiation and nothing in between. However, there is this statement of win-win. And how do we accomplish win-win if there are only winners and losers in negotiation? Well, let me share that with you because this really made sense when doing the research. So I really like the, the comment that there are winners and losers and you want to be a winner in negotiation all the time. And I wrote this program on how to win every negotiation on your terms every time, no matter what. That is great. And yes, you will learn to do that in step number six of the manifesto, which is part of sales intelligence. But... Win-win is coming to an agreement. And what you'll find is that in negotiation, we can leverage, we can leverage negotiation tactics in one of three ways. We can leverage it by screaming and yelling. And this includes table pounding and getting excited and that's crazy and talking loud and lots of gestures and hand movements and so on. And that is your customer. That's how they do it. Okay, that is one way to leverage power, so to speak, in negotiation, especially with automobiles. Secondly is silence. So have you heard the term, the first person that speaks loses? I'm sure you have. And if you haven't, you just did. So there's this concept, and it is correct, but it's most often leveraged incorrectly. So wouldn't you agree that most salespeople are extroverts, as I am? There's lots of gestures, and they're talking, and they're smiling, and they're entertaining. But at the end of the day, those extroverts may have a, a tendency to oversell their position and talk themselves right out of a sale. Just too much talking. And that primarily happens with the listener type of buyer behavior. That extrovert salesperson misinterprets that listener's politeness for being interested in what they have to say, and they're really not. When it comes to negotiation, that listener is exerting an enormous amount of pressure, like an incredible thousands of tons of pressure, pressure that can create diamonds on that extrovert salesperson just by listening twice as much as they talk. So the concept of the first person who speaks loses is when you deliver up a closing statement and but not, that's it. That's how simple it is. Now, where most teachers, trainers, authors, authors and speakers, be it in the automobile business or out of the automobile business for that matter, where they fail and don't help you with the concept is that in each one of these position changes, you want to remain constant for 15 minutes. Well, screaming and yelling for 15 minutes just doesn't work. It's physically exhausting and, and it's not going to last. Not to mention it would look really unusual if you're screaming and yelling at your customer and vice versa. And if you have an open desk showroom type of selling scenario, it would be really distracting for everyone around you. So that's not really, not really going to happen. But while they're getting excited, you can explain your situation and why the price of cars have risen, cars, trucks, vans, and minivans, that's what I'm talking about, why interest rates are where they are, why uh, our lease rates and residuals are where they are, and that may, or trade-in values, that may justify the screaming and yelling. When it comes to the silence and you deliver up your closing line, it's time to button up and sit and wait. And especially if anybody says, that price is crazy, that's nuts, I'd never pay that, or how much are you going to give me? off. Yeah, I like it. I would go with it, but I need to know what kind of a discount. It better be a good one. Your reaction, negotiation is as much, well, the skill of negotiation is your ability to act, to, to influence a decision, right? To influence others and make them your friend, as Dale Carnegie would say. So your silence position would be to start with, what? Too much? Really? Keep in mind where we are in the sales process. 
We've done a great meeting and greeting. We've done a selective interview on the perfect vehicle that would be right for them. We found out that they have a trade, so that's not a surprise. We didn't appraise it. We've told them what our advertisement is in terms of price, so we have commitment on affordability. And now, after a selective walk around demonstration drive, a firm appraisal of their vehicle, we're finding out that's way too much. You need to react. You need to sit back into your chair. You're like, what? Why? When did that come up? Hours ago, minutes ago, you told me everything was fine. And now it's too much? That's negotiation. Negotiation isn't ta tr tricky talk tracks. Negotiation isn't elaborate word tracks. All of that helps, unquestionably. And there's some patented talk tracks. And I have that in step number six of the manifesto. If you want to know more about the manifesto, get that. You get not only the online video on demand, you get weekly classes and you get me personalized one-on-one. -on -one. You get on my calendar, on your schedule, on your terms, on my calendar to really rehearse and go through this. But when you deliver up that reaction and you sit back and you're like, how can this be a problem? Why didn't you tell me earlier? Now you start to follow the customer focused approach to closing and negotiation. And the customer focused approach to closing and negotiation is to offer choices. So all of a sudden we've got this, we give them this reaction, it's too much, and you sit back and you just go silent. Now, most of us can't stand that level of pressure, silence, and, and always remember, you don't want it to go much more than 15 minutes, so there's a chance that you may have to speak. Even though I've said, the first person who speaks loses. Even though you've heard this from somebody else, maybe they've demonstrated it for you. But the bottom line is, after 15 minutes, come on, somebody has to speak. And that is because, in order for us to get to an agreement, we must be communicating. But, you leverage the pressure appropriately, and maybe it didn't work. That tactic just does not, it's not foolproof. It's not absolutely perfect. Otherwise, everybody would do it and all the time. And then customers would get familiar with it and they do it right back to you. And maybe you've experienced that. A customer has sat there very, very quiet. We may have misinterpreted them as a listener when they're actually exerting pressure on us. So the third way that we can exert pressure in negotiation is by, when all else fails, beg and plead. Begging and pleading. Now, when we beg and plead, it's a little bit different than how somebody might actually do begging and pleading in a non-automobile scenario of negotiation. What begging and pleading would be for us, in our particular case, would be a manager turnover. Not that the manager is going to come in and wear a pair of knees, kneeling down at the side of the desk and begging this individual to, to purchase the vehicle, but leveraging the customer-focused approach by offering choices, that's what the begging and pleading in automobile sales really is all about. Now, from our perspective, moving to a less expensive vehicle with less equipment obviously makes it, less af makes it more affordable, lowers our gross. It's not as shiny and glitzy as the fully loaded top of the line one, but it gets you a sticker on the board, which you can get two referrals from that, who have two referrals, who have two referrals, who have two referrals, which you can get the second car in the driveway, which have two referrals and two referrals and two referrals. This is how you quickly and easily get to double digits. And if you're in double digits, you get into 20s. And if you're in 20s and you say, Bill, it's no possible way that I could sell 30. It is because you need to leverage the apps and technology in step number nine to get more done in four hours than most do an entire week in order to get to that level. Can you do it? Absolutely. Becomes autopilot. The flywheel starts to spin at 10. That's why I say, let's get you to at least 10 cars a month. If you're not consistently with predictable consistency at 10, your flywheel's not spinning. If you're hitting 8, 12, 9, 13, 6, 8, 10, that's not consistent. That's not the flywheel turning. Consistency is 12, 15, 13, 14, 12, 11, 13, because the flywheel has momentum and that drives traffic to you. And when you've got that kind of momentum, 18, 22, 25, 35, 40, and 60 cars a month is possible.
but stay with me. I'm, I'm not suggesting for a second that we go down that rabbit hole right now. What we want to do is get to that predictable consistency, and let's say it's 15 cars a month which is not difficult to do, but it may, me, may seem like a monumental task for you. And believe me, it wasn't that long ago that I was there with you. I'm like, there is no way. I wouldn't even listen to anybody talk like that because for me, just hitting 10, it's a hurdle. It's an enormous amount of energy. And, and it happens when your negotiation gets really great. And not that you want to beg and plead for deals, but what you got to keep in the back of your mind, that if you don't fall the customer focus approach by offering choices and getting no, no, no answers on those alternatives gets you to yes, because you can say to the customer, do you hear what you're saying? Do you really hear what you're saying? I've offered, I've offered, I've offered, and now you're telling me, no, 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 this is what you want. And they're like, yeah, it is what I want. Then press hard three copies, and when would you like to take delivery? Today, tomorrow, or on the weekend or two days from now, whatever it takes for you to get the vehicle ready for delivery. That's closing, not negotiating. You're negotiating the delivery time, but you're asking for the sale at the same time. And that's what I mean by most automobile sales trainers, teachers, authors, coaches, speakers don't align those tactics. They tell you how to do some negotiation with a fancy talk track, some slick trickery, or they tell you they mask closing with a negotiation tactic. At the end of the day, the two must blend. And you can't forget to ask for the sale, but you can't ask for the sale until you've got the commitment to buy. You get the commitment to buy by negotiating colors, features, equipment, payments, trade-ins. Always talk car on your feet, out on the lot, walking around, pardon me, even in the showroom, and you talk price in your seat, sitting down at your desk. We don't talk, and when I talk price, I'm not talking about introducing to it the advertisement or sticker or um, what do you think I can buy it for. You can give them a little bit of a hint, especially if there's a manufacturer's discount. Keep that in your back pocket. Serve that up on your feet. When it comes to negotiating your gross profit, which is part of your commission, and think of it like this, you're now paying someone to drive your automobile away. I don't know why you do that other than buying advertising. In other words, if this individual is going to send you lots of business, then it's going to be a good idea for you to pay them to drive your automobile. But here's the thing. When you get commitment throughout the sale with my overview benefit and permission commitment strategy, you're negotiating all the way to yes. And so your close becomes extremely easy at the end of the process, the purchase consultation. That's why I say car on your feet, price in your seat, no two ways about it. And it just makes life so much easier to be able to do on a regular basis. What I find average autom automotive salespeople do on a regular basis, which compromises their ability to negotiate, is that they don't take the time to read well, the customer's hot buttons. You don't need to read the customer. You're never going to be able to get in their head and completely know for sure. But what you've got to do is deliver up your attractive character. Your attractive character comes out when you follow the customer focus approach and you offer up choices. So for instance, when we get to negotiating price now, let's say for instance, and I don't ever advocate and suggest that you negotiate on gross price or MSRP or selling price. And the only reason I say that is that that number is big and it's really big right now, especially with inflation and especially with demand. And it just makes it far too easy for a client to say, I won't give you that much, but I'll give you this much. Instead, try to get to at least a monthly payment, and I would be really flabbergasted and surprised if a lot of you are working from just a monthly payment. I would get to a bi-weekly payment as fast as you possibly can. And then, of course, I know you're going to debate with me and challenge me on, but Bill, we've got a lot of customers that like to pay cash because they put it on their line of credit and they can get a better interest rate there. Great. That's fine. You're right. They are paying cash. So in that particular scenario, and let's say they really have saved up the money and they're paying cash and they don't want to take advantage of our financing program, then what happens is you will suggest the selling price 
the manufacturer's discount, and hopefully there's a manufacturer's discount, there's something for you to start it off with. Then you suggest another discount. The discount below the manufacturer's discount is really, really low. Like we're talking $300 on a $60,000, $70,000, $80,000 vehicle. That is necessary to shock them into reality, give them a slap in the face and say, we just don't have the kind of markup that you're looking for. You don't say, we just don't have the kind of markup you're looking for because they don't care. They don't care how much money you're making or losing. They don't care if they're buying it for cost. The customer's greatest concern with the purchasing a vehicle right here at the very top is price because it's what's coming out of their pocket. They don't care how much money you're making or losing. You are the last thing on that list. The good news is you made the list of five things. However, when you survey those exact same people afterwards, after the negotiation's all done, and by the way, did you know this statistic? Only 17% of people like the negotiation process when purchasing an automobile. 17%. And that is not a made-up statistic. That can be supported with a footnote from the NADA, from the Automotive Business School of Canada, where I am an adjunct professor of studies at, with my students doing that survey, and my colleague Joe Lascada, who's done a great job of compiling all that information to 17%. Now, when we say 17%, don't get sidetracked just by the statistic alone because it's on a varying level of acceptance to negotiation. I call it a sliding scale. Think of it this way. The person at the 17 mark, like that's 80, at the 84% out of 100% of people, at 84%, that individual is going to want to negotiate more than the person at 83%. So to give you some level of understanding on this, the person at 50% really doesn't want to negotiate. And the person at 25% is hardly negotiating at all. They're maybe asking you, you know, do you think I could get it by the weekend? Do you think I could get it maybe in a couple of days? A very easy negotiation element on the list of what's important for them to be able to get that you can accomplish quickly. But the individual at 84% really is possibly looking for how much you can do off. Not how much the manufacturer's already given. They just throw that at the window. It's what you can do for me now. As we climb that scale from 80, 84 to 90 to 95, all the way up to the one percenters, at 99 to 100%, if that 100% that represents the total population, where only 17% like to negotiate, now we're up at the top of the 99. Those are the ones that are the table pounders and the yellers and screamers, and they're not taking this for that, and they get a better deal down the road. And not everybody's like that. And you may have joined this seminar because you feel like, ah, oh, yeah, all my customers are doing that to me. They may be doing that to you because you're not getting the commitment all the way along. You're not negotiating to yes from the interview through the new vehicle and just simply naming in the interview what all your new vehicles have, like power windows, power door locks, tilt steering, cruise control, um, blue, black, or yellow, or white in color. Is that a nice vehicle? That in itself is a negotiated close right out of the gate at the interview to make sure that we're on the right vehicle. Because if we're not on the right vehicle, you don't want to spend the next hour, two, three hours of your time just to find out later, I want to think about it, and then they ghost you. All the way through to the advertisement, which happens, just name the advertisement, whatever you are advertising right now. Even if the 0% doesn't apply to you because the term is so short, it's a safe bet for the manufacturer to be able to advertise that. But at the end of the day, that's what everybody wants. That's why they're doing it. Yeah, the term is really short. Yes, the bi-weekly is going to be really big, but it's not your money. It's the customer's money. So make sure you get the yes or no that that is affordable or that it is not. Before you move on to the walk around, getting confirmation, do you like this? Does it make sense? Could you see yourself owning? That's negotiating all the way along. This is the second greatest financial decision that we make next to buying a house. We can't take this lightly. Consumers do not make this decision in jest or emotionally as much as it may look like it. Even with sports cars and highly desirable vehicles, they've thought about it. They've transcended a buying process of thinking, talking, research that Google tells us it takes six months, six months on average to purchase an automobile. 180 websites, multitude of pages. And I know from our research, if one vehicle gets 27 impressions, specifically on pictures, then it'll probably sell in 72 hours. 
That's not negotiation. That's advertising and marketing to draw people in. Once they get to you and they say, do you have, that's not negotiating, that's closing. Yes, I do. Would you like to see it? That's closing. That's getting to a final decision. Now we take them out and we leverage the customer focus approach to negotiating to a close by offering choices. I have this one, I also have this one, and I have this one. Now we're currently advertising it for, is that affordable? If we're not leveraging those tactics perfectly aligned for the close, then yes, you will have to always rely on discounting the vehicle and discounting the vehicle really isn't much of a negotiation if you're not bumping them up. If you're simply coming down and coming down and coming down and coming down, it's more of an auction process and auctioning is not negotiating. I thought I'd try and bring a little bit of light to that, give you some new material, a completely different perspective because the students that I have, and especially one that is in seven figures selling automobiles, and albeit he has a staff working for him, I will be candid and clear on that. To get to those levels, to get into a very healthy six-figure level, you do have to scale your activities just like the dealership has with you as a salesperson, the service advisors writing service orders, the technicians fixing the cars at back, the managers overseeing all of it. You would not at that level of that many people, but you would have to scale your activities to be able to sell that many vehicles. But even with all those guys, these fundamental basics that I have taught them and still coach them to this day work like clockwork. And it's simple and straightforward. It's really looking at, Lord gave you two ears, one mouth, twice as much listening as talking to determine what is the behavior that you have that this individual is purchasing. That'll speak volumes about the hot buttons and the urgency that they have right now. And that will determine your behavior in negotiation. And you won't be surprised when you get to that negotiated level of how they act and behave. My name is Bill Harvey with the Auto Sales Academy. Thank you so much for joining me. For those of you in Canada, have a fantastic Victoria Day holiday weekend. For those of you in the US, I hope you have some amazing weather as well. Please join me next week uh, for another live session. And pardon me, excuse me, dry throat. I should have had something to drink. I hope you're thoroughly enjoying these programs. Definitely leave a comment. That is so fantastic to know that I can see a number of your names that are on here right now, and that's wonderful. But please leave a comment. That would be great. Even if it was just a thumbs up, that is terrific, a reaction. But a little bit of a question more. And most importantly, if you want to know more about the manifesto, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Now is our time to make hay while the sun is shining. You don't want to come to me in at the end of November and say, hey, Bill, I really got to get to double digits like next month. Let's do it now so that you can experiment with these tactics on customers walking through the door right now, which I don't think is the right person to experiment on. You should be experimenting on friends and family, but there's so much traffic flowing in. It's our opportunity to really make this work. You can see the results happen instantly. And then those months in Q4 and Q2 of next year, when it, seasonality kicks in, you're sailing through it. The flywheel is spinning. You've got double digit sales coming in predictably because your pipeline is full and your funnel's working for you. Again, my name is Bill Harvey with the Auto Sales Academy. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye for now.